All right, welcome everybody. This is our February transition chat. Our topic tonight is applying for SSI and we have our speaker, Michael Dalto of High Note Consulting. Here, um, Michael is very well versed on these, these issues. He knows a lot about social security in general and SSI specifically, and we're really zeroing in on that topic tonight because um, people have a lot of um, anxiety usually about um, getting getting the SSI part right for their, their children or their young adult children. Mm -hmm. So I am going to turn it over to Michael now. His slides are up and um, please begin. Thank you, Anne. Welcome everyone. So I have a son who's now grown and if you ever need him, please don't tell him that I told this story in public because it happened when he was toilet training. But uh, after he'd been practicing this new skill for a while, we agreed that he was ready to go out on sort of a test run. And he got dressed in his big boy underpants, no diaper. And I strapped him into his car seat and I drove about 15 minutes. And every single minute I turned around and asked him, do you have to go? And he kept shaking his head. No, got to our destination, parked the car, unstrapped him, lifted him out of his seat. You're all parents. You know what I discovered? He was soaking wet. He said, I asked you every minute if you had to go, why didn't you say something? And he looked at me with these big innocent eyes and said, but I wanted it to be a surprise. <laughs> and that was the day that I learned that my son might have a future working for social security <laughs> because <laughs> you usually get the information you need from them, but it's often just a little too late. So I hope you're getting this information in a timely way. Um, I'm going to start by just giving a little bit of background information, a little bit of information basics about what SSI is, about nine slides on that. And then we're going to go right into how you can apply and how, how you can improve your chances of getting your sons or daughters application approved and how you can, what you can do to try to speed up the process as much as possible. So what is SSI? It's a cash benefit that people get from Social Security if they have a significant disability and they don't have much money. Uh, you have to have low income and low resources. Resources would be another term for assets. Um, also, a lot of people don't know you could be 65 or older even if you don't have a disability and qualify for SSI if you're financially eligible, but obviously that's not going to be relevant for us. So SSI stands for Supplemental Security Income. It's designed to provide at least a basic minimum amount of income for an eligible person to pay for food and shelter. So who is eligible? People with disabilities of any age from birth through however long they live, or people 65 or older, even if they're not disabled, have to be a US citizen or a non-citizen who meets certain requirements and have to have income and resources or assets below certain limits. We'll come back to that in a moment. So how disabled does a person need to be? Well, they have to have a severe disability that's lasted or is expected to last at least a year, or it could be a terminal illness. And for adults 18 or older, the disability has to prevent the person from doing substantial work. And usually substantial work means being able to earn before taxes at least $1,550 a month, like gross wages. Or if the person is blind, um, at least $2,590 a month, uh, gross wages. But in many cases, a person could be eligible even if they're earning more than that. Uh, that's something I want you to know. I can't go into a whole lot of detail about it right now, but there's a persistent myth that if you're able to work at all, you're not eligible for SSI. And if you're already working when you apply, then you're really not eligible for SSI. Those are both myths. 
A person can be capable of working. They can even be working throughout the application process. Their disability has to limit their ability to work, but not necessarily prevent them from working at all. So if a person is blind, they meet Social Security's definition of blindness, then they could be doing substantial work and could still be eligible for SSI. There are special rules for blind people kind of peppered throughout Social Security programs because the National Federation of the Blind, headquartered in Baltimore, uh, it is, it has been the most effective advocate of any disability group uh, lobby in the country. Um, so what is Social Security's definition of blindness? It means the vision in the person's better eye with glasses or with correction is 20 over 200 or less, or their field of vision is 20 degrees or less. So if a person meets that definition of blindness, then they could be earning even more money and still qualify, uh, more money from work, and still qualify for SSI. So what is the limit on income? First, let me explain the difference between income and resources. So I mentioned there's an income limit and a resource limit. What's the difference? I have a trainer friend who likes to say, income is what you get and resources are what you got. So if you get money or your son or your daughter gets money in a particular calendar month, that money counts as income. If they have any of that money left over, when the next calendar month begins, at midnight on the first day of the next calendar month, that leftover amount becomes a resource and it remains a resource for as long as they have it. So when in the month that you get money, it counts as income and it's subject to the income limit. Any money you have left over, carrying over into the next month, becomes a resource and that's subject to the resource limit. So it's income the month you get it, becomes a resource every month after that. So what is the income limit? It depends on the kind of income the person has. If they have so-called unearned income, like social security checks, pensions, dividends, interest, etc., and that's their only income, the income must usually be under $963 a month in 2024. But if they don't have any unearned income, they're getting only SSI, and then they start working, they get earned income like wages or money from self-employment, their earnings before taxes are taken out, like gross wages, would usually have to be under $1,971 a month after the person has qualified for SSI initially, and they could still get at least $1 of SSI. So I wanted you to be aware that your son or your daughter can be capable of working, they can even be working when you apply for SSI, and they could still be eligible for at least some SSI, particularly if their earnings are under $1,971 a month before taxes. So what's the limit on resources? Remember, money that carries over from the month you got it into the next month becomes a resource. And the limit on resources is just $2,000. So what kinds of resources or assets count against that $2,000 limit? Cash, bank accounts, stocks, bonds, investments, um, the cash value of a whole life insurance policy, retirement accounts, property other than the home the person lives in, all examples of resources that count. 
but it's good to know there are some key types of resources that don't count against that $2,000 limit. The home the person lives in, even if they own it free and clear with no mortgage and it's worth a million dollars, as long as you live in the home you own, it does not count as a resource and neither does one motor vehicle. Um, life insurance that has no cash value, like term insurance, meaning you can't take any money out of it without someone dying. Um, certain burial funds, special needs trusts. You may have heard of these special accounts set up to benefit a person with a disability. The money in the account can only be used to pay for expenses for the person with the disability, but the person with a disability does not own the account and they don't control it. Another person called the trustee is responsible for managing the money in the account and withdrawing it and spending it, but they're bound by law to spend the money only on expenses for the person with a disability. So any amount in a special needs trust that's been set up correctly does not count against the $2,000 limit. Neither does property that's used for a job or business and up to $100,000 in something called an ABLE account. If you're not familiar with an ABLE account, it's a great way to be able to save money it's an account that's owned by the person with a disability and they can control the money in it. Although if they're not able to manage money, another person can help them with that. And um, you can get information about the ABLE account program in Maryland at Maryland spelled out ABLE, A-B-L-E dot org. Uh, I definitely encourage you to look into it. It's a great way for your son or daughter to be able to save money and not have it jeopardize their SSI eligibility. So what's the maximum SSI a person can get? This year, it's $943 a month. It usually goes up somewhat each year. Last year, it was $914 a month for an unmarried person. For a married couple, it's one and a half times that amount. Um, to get the maximum, an adult needs to be paying for food and shelter. They can't be getting free food and shelter. If they don't pay for food and shelter, the most SSI they can get is only two thirds of the maximum, only $628 and change per month. But if a person starts out with the maximum SSI of 943 a month, and then they get other income other than the SSI, the other income will usually reduce the amount of SSI they get. So SSI comes with a medical benefit called medical assistance also known as Medicaid. This is one of the cardinal rules for bureaucrats trying to confuse the public. Give each benefit more than one name. That keeps everyone off balance. So Medicaid is the generic term for this benefit, this medical benefit that exists in every state, but some states give it another name as well. And in Maryland, it's known as medical assistance. But Medicaid is very different from Medicare, which we won't be talking about today. And that's another rule for bureaucrats confusing the public is give very different benefits, very similar names. But Medicaid equals medical assistance in the state of Maryland. They're both terms for the same medical benefit. Um, medical assistance covers pretty much any medical expense you would expect uh, medical insurance to cover. It's free and there are basically no out-of-pocket costs 
with the exception of very sm small co-pays for prescriptions. Um, but you do have to find healthcare providers who participate in medical assistance. All hospitals and pharmacies, in my experience, do accept medical assistance. Beyond that, it's hit or miss. But if a person has other health insurance, they can also have medical assistance. And medical assistance will typically cover some expenses, some services that other insurance will rarely, if ever, cover. And sometimes medical assistance can help with some of the out-of-pocket costs like co-pays and deductibles. And if a person gets any amount of SSI from the maximum $943 a month, down, right on down to the minimum $1 a month, they're automatically eligible for medical assistance. But once your son or daughter gets approved for SSI, the medical assistance card won't come automatically in the mail. You need to contact your local Department of Social Services and ask them what you need to do to get a medical assistance card and they'll tell you. All right, so that's kind of an overview of medical, uh, excuse me, of SSI and who's eligible, et cetera. Now let's get into the, the subject you've been waiting for. How do you apply for SSI? You've got a couple of options. You can apply by telephone. They're not currently taking applications in person in social security offices and they haven't since before the pandemic but you can apply over the phone and you can make an appointment by calling their national toll-free number, 800-772-1213 to schedule an appointment. Or if your son or daughter meets the conditions on slide 12 that I'll go through in a moment, you can apply online using the link at the top of slide 12. And you can apply for SSI for your son or daughter if between they're between the ages of 18 and 65. I'm assuming they will be. Um, they've never been married. They're not blind. They're a US citizen living in the US. They haven't applied for or received SSI in the past and they're applying for another benefit called SSDI at the same time. SSDI stands for Social Security Disability Insurance, and you don't really need to be concerned about that last bullet point because when you apply for SSI, Social Security automatically checks to see if you may be eligible for SSDI. So applying for SSI is pretty much uh, at the same time, applying for SSDI. Um, so if your son or daughter meets all these criteria on slide 12, then you could apply for SSI online using the link. So if you want to get a list of documents that you may need to get together to apply for SSI, you can find them at the link on slide 13. And in order to get an idea of what questions you'll have to answer on the various forms uh, to apply for SSI, whether you're gonna do it online or by phone, you can use the links on slide 14 uh, the first link is to the SSI application form called the SSA 8000. The next is to the disability report that gives a lot more detailed information about your son's or daughter's disability. And that's the SSA 3368 form. And then the, there's an authorization to release information, the SSA 827 form 
that's just a form that your son or your daughter signs, assuming they're an adult, 18 or older, that, um, or that you would sign if you were their legal guardian, that authorizes uh, medical providers, schools, et cetera, to release records to document your son's or daughter's disability to Social Security. So you can review those forms in advance so you'll have all the answers available, uh, whether you apply by phone or um, online. So I wanted to give you some tips on how to get SSI approved, how to boost the chances the SSI application will be approved, and how to speed up the process. So first of all, you should apply as soon as your son or daughter may be eligible. For, now, most children under the age of 18 are not eligible for SSI because of their parents' money. A child under 18 who lives with one or two parents um, is most often not eligible for SSI because a portion of the parent's income and resources counts against the child for SSI purposes. And, um, and if the parents have significant income or resources or both, that will prevent the child from getting SSI. But most young people who have uh, severe disabilities will become eligible for SSI once they become adults, once they turn 18. At that point, only their own income and resources count. And unless they've got substantial income or resources of their own, they will likely be financially eligible for SSI. And if they have a severe disability, then it's likely they'll be eligible for SSI uh, in terms of disability as well, and they could get it. So when your son or daughter turns 18, one of their birthday gifts can be an application for SSI. But you wanna wait until they turn 18 to apply if you have significant income, if the parents have significant income and or resources, because your child probably won't be eligible before age 18 otherwise. Secondly, get medical records and school records that document their disability. This can be probably the best way you can speed up the process. Now, if you ask Social Security, should I get medical and school records for my son or daughter when we apply for SSI, they might say, no, you don't have to do that. The form that your son or daughter is signing uh, that uh, will authorize uh, medical providers and school to release records to Social Security. And that's true, but it often takes a lot longer for Social Security to get the records when they request them than it would if you requested them. And if you're on this call, I would imagine you probably already have in your possession a substantial amount of medical and school records that do document your son's or daughter's disability. Um, in terms of medical stuff, it might be the most recent psychological evaluation or um, psychiatric evaluation or a physical evaluation if your son or daughter has a, a physical disability. Um, school records could be IEPs, Section 504 plans, et cetera. The most recent records are the most important, but it doesn't hurt to have some older ones to show that your son's or daughter's disability may be of long duration. So it's not something new. So it may take a little extra effort on your part to get some of these records, but it can speed up the process enough that it'll be worth it. 
Now, when you're completing the application, especially the disability report form that goes into lots of details about your son's or daughter's disability, remember you have to play the deficit game. In all other facets, or probably almost all other facets of your son's or daughter's life, you're gonna be emphasizing their strengths, their abilities, their interests, the positives. But when you're applying for SSI, you have to play the deficit game. You have to focus on how the disability limits your son's or daughter's activities, especially activities that are usually necessary to do a job or do, do some type of paid work, like standing, walking, lifting, handling, seeing, hearing, speaking, understanding and following instructions, etc. So when you're filling out the forms, and for example, you come to a question that asks you to describe your son's or daughter's activities from when they get up in the morning until they go to bed at night. You don't wanna simply say, well, she gets up, she has breakfast, she gets on the bus, she goes to school, she comes home, she does homework, she watches TV and she goes to bed because that could describe any student. Um, with or without a disability. You would want to explain how each activity is affected by her disability. For example, she has difficulty getting up in the morning because of a sleep disorder or her medication used to control her disability makes her groggy or she has a, an intellectual disability that prevents her from setting the alarm on her own or she couldn't hear an alarm because she's deaf. Uh, she gets up, she um, goes to get breakfast, she is able to pour cereal into a bowl, but she doesn't have the manual dexterity to be able to pour milk without spilling it all over. I, you get the idea. So always emphasize how the disability limits your sons or daughters daily activities that may be related to work, to doing paid work. Now, if your son or daughter has done any paid or even unpaid work, it can be helpful to get a letter or a statement from their employer or someone else who's familiar with their work experience a job coach, a teacher, or some school staff who's uh, responsible for um, some work activity they did as part of the school curriculum or to supplement it, and have that letter explain how the disability limited their work activities. So as I said, you can be capable of working, you can even be working when you apply, and still get approved for SSI, but you have to show that your disability limits your work activities, doesn't have to prevent them. Now, because Social Security's definition of disability for adults is very much connected to the ability to work, it can actually be helpful for your son or daughter to have some work experience and get a statement from an employer or someone else that explains how their disability affected their ability to work. If your son or daughter has no work experience at all, then it's a guess on Social Security's part how their disability limits their ability to work. If they've actually had experience, then that letter from a knowledgeable person like an employer will really help Social Security, can help them approve the SSI application. Of course, if Social Security asks for more information, provide it as soon as possible. If you don't provide enough medical and perhaps school records for Social Security to feel like they can determine that your son or daughter is medically eligible for SSI, then they will schedule 
an appointment for your son or daughter to get a medical evaluation. They pay for it, but you have to get your son or daughter there. Um, so you definitely want to keep that appointment if they schedule one. But if you provide enough medical records, school records, etc., on your own, it may not be necessary for them to schedule an appointment with one of their doctors. And you would be better off because if, the, if your son or daughter goes to one of their doctors, they'll have no experience with your son or daughter. They might evaluate them for 20 minutes and you have no idea what they're going to say. Far better to get records from your sons or daughters, uh, medical providers and school staff uh, who know your son or daughter. You want to keep copies of anything that you send to Social Security. And anything that you send them, request a receipt for. This is an agency that lives and dies by paperwork. They get tons and tons of it. And I'm sorry to say, they lose things more often than I would like to believe. But they do lose things. If you keep copies, that's important in case they lose something. And if you get a receipt that they receive documents from you, then you have proof that not only you sent them the documents, but they got them. So if they claim they don't have them or they lost them, you'll have proof that, well, I sent it to you and you got it. And then you can provide copies of the copies that you've kept. Um, and, uh, and move on from there. But they can't, uh, you know, if you've got a receipt, they can't deny that they received those documents. They'd have to acknowledge that they lost them. You want to keep everything that Social Security sends you. And, you know, we're, we're typically told to keep tax records, like tax returns, for seven years. I keep Social Security records even longer because sometimes they'll come back and they'll look at something that happened 10 or more years ago. So just keep everything they send you. It may very well help you in the future. Now, the most difficult and time consuming part of the SSI application is called the disability determination. When the application goes to Social Security, Curiously enough, Social Security has the smallest role in deciding whether your son or daughter is eligible. They look at the application, they check to see if your son or daughter is financially eligible. Do they have low enough income and low enough resources? If they say yes, your son or daughter is financially eligible, then they send the application to a state agency that's called Disability Determination Services, or DDS for short. Social Security hires DDS to do the disability determination, to evaluate whether your son's or daughter's disability is severe enough to qualify for SSI. And DDS goes through a five-step process to evaluate your son's or daughter's disability. The first step is to ask, is your son or daughter doing substantial work now? If they are, then they don't meet the adult definition of disability and their SSI will be denied. But if their earnings are below these, uh, the substantial level, which I mentioned is generally $1,550 a month for a person who's not blind, then th they would pass step one and move on to step two. And the st step two is, does the person have a severe disability? If not, they're denied. If they do, then you go on to step three. Step three is, does the person's disability meet or equal the criteria for a disability 
in something called the listing of impairments. I'm going to show you what that looks like in a moment. If their, their, their disability meets the criteria for a disability on this listing of impairments, then they should be approved. And that would be it. They would be approved at step three. If the disability does not meet all the criteria for a disability on the listing of impairments, then they go on to step four, which asks, can the person do work that they've done in the past at the substantial level? If they can, then they're denied. If they can't, then they go on to step five. If they've never worked in the past, then step four would be moot and they'd go on to step five as well. And step five is, can the person do any other kind of work at the substantial level? If they can, then they'll be denied. If not, then they'll be approved. But the best chance of getting approved and certainly getting approved most quickly is if your son's or daughter's disability meets the criteria under a disability in the listing of impairments. That's step three. So you can find the listing of impairments for adults at the link on slide 26. And I'm going to show you what it looks like. When you go into that link, you'll see a list of all the various body systems. And what you want to do is consider your son's or daughter's disability or their primary disability and see where would that fit. Let's say your son or daughter has autism. That's going to fit under mental disorders. And then when you click on that link for mental disorders, it will show you very specific criteria, and you can see them listed on slide 29. Um, actually, you've got under section here, it lists a variety of mental disabilities. Uh, you'd have to scroll down a little farther to get down to autism spectrum disorder. And when you click on that, then you get the very specific criteria. And in this case, your son or daughter would have to meet both of the criteria under A and extreme limitation of one or marked limitation of two of the following areas of mental functioning. There are four of them. You'll see you also see some sublinks some 12.00, et cetera, uh, in blue. These are sublinks. And if you click on those, they, they give you deeper details and explanations. So if your son or daughter meets all the criteria specified under autism spectrum disorder, then they should be approved at step three for SSI. What I recommend is that you look at those criteria for your son's or daughter's disability or primary disability, look at any records that you already have, medical records, school records, and see if the records seem to bear out that your son or daughter meets all of these criteria. If they don't, or if it's not completely clear that the records show that your son or daughter meet meets all these criteria, then you can share the criteria, maybe send a link to their doctor, psychologist, et cetera, and ask them if they can write a report that shows that your son or daughter meets those criteria, assuming that they do. So I'm not asking you to ask them to falsify anything, to claim that your son or daughter meets the criteria if they don't. But rather, you're simply saying, if your son or daughter meets those criteria, 
in the opinion of their doctor. Ask the doctor to write a report so that it shows that they meet those criteria. They could even use the language in the criteria so that it makes it easier for Disability Determination Services, DDS, to see that, oh yes, they meet the criteria. If your son or daughter has more than one disability, look at the criteria for all of their disabilities and try to make sure that um, if they don't meet all of the criteria for their primary disability, that they meet at least some of them and perhaps they meet some of the criteria for their other disabilities. It's often the case that if a person has more than one disability, they don't meet all the criteria for any single disability, the combination of disabilities can get them approved. Now, if they don't meet enough criteria in the listing of impairments to get approved at step three, they can still be found disabled at step four, which is able to do past work at the substantial level or, or, or unable to do past work at the substantial level or step five, unable to do any work at the substantial level, um, they could still be approved. So, uh, but if they, if you can come up with enough documentation to show that they should be approved at step three. That's a surer way to get approved in a quicker way. Now, after you've applied, you wanna follow up periodically, call your local social security office and verify once they've finished their initial review to see if your son or daughter is financially eligible. And once they have, ask them if they've sent the application on to DDS, Disability Determination Services. Now, it says here, it usually takes at least a few weeks for Social Security to send the application to DDS. It's more like a few months these days. They're really backed up. Um, you can find information for your local Social Security office at the link on slide 33. Once your local social security office says, yes, we've sent the application to DDS, then you can call the phone number on slide 34 to get the name and phone number of the disability examiner who's gonna be conducting the disability determination and contact that disability examiner and act like you are their best friend. You're going to help make their job easier. You can make sure that they've received and uh, copies of any medical or school records that you've already sent. If they haven't received uh, some of them or if you haven't sent any yet, then ask them how to send the records to them. That will give them more information, make their job easier and help get your son's or daughter's application approved more quickly. If the application is denied, you should appeal within 60 days. It's actually within 65 days of the date on the denial letter. So you've got just over two months to, uh, to appeal. You can use the request for reconsideration form, the SSA 561 form, which is linked on slide 35. If the denial was because they said your son's or daughter's disability wasn't se severe enough, they're able to work, etc., then try to get more or better records to prove the disability. If you're denied again, then appeal again. The third time is usually the charm. If your son or daughter is denied on the first try, they'll probably be denied on the second try, the first appeal. 
but more than half of SSI applications that were denied the first time get approved on the second appeal, the third try. So don't give up. And we have time for questions now. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Um, let's, uh, yeah, I was going to say stop sharing your screen and we'll use the hand raising um, little icon if we could, and then I'll call on hand raisers. And if you don't want to speak, you can put your question in the chat and I'll read it. All right, Emily Watts. Hi, thank you. That was a great uh, presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, so question for you in regards to our foster care children. Um, if they're in foster care, who applies for SSI and who can actually have access to that money? Well, that's a great question, Emily. Um, and thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed the session. Um, I think that's something you would need to discuss with the foster care system, which, you know, I'm assuming maybe the Department of Social Services because different local departments have different processes in place about who's responsible for applying for SSI. Um, if, you're, if you have foster children, it's, it's quite often the case that the foster care system, maybe a social worker would be responsible for that application for SSI. Uh, but you want to check with them and find out. Now, I did want to mention, uh, well, um, let me finish answering your question first, and then I want to give you a little bit more information. Um, who's responsible for managing the money? Again, that may be the foster care system, um, more likely than not. Uh, but it's possible, I'd, you know, you'd have to talk to them possible that they could make you the representative payee. That's a person who's responsible for managing the SSI benefits and making sure that they get spent appropriately on necessary living expenses for the foster child. Um, one thing I did want to mention, I said that for children under age 18, they're generally not eligible for SSI because of their parents' money, their parents' income and resources, at least part of them count against the child. That is not true for foster children. So if you have foster children, they have no income or resources of their own or very little income or resources, they may be eligible because your money, the foster parents' money doesn't count. Thanks. Okay, we have questions from Bonnie and then Carol. Hi. Hi, Bonnie. Um, so I was wondering if um, the SSI is the same as uh, DDA, because Kennedy Krieger told me to uh, apply my daughter for DDA, and I've done that, but we're still kind of in the holding pattern. Um, we have a company that's working with us to give resources until she's of age. Welcome to the alphabet soup <laughs> of the adult disability world. Um, yes, uh, let me distinguish between SSI and DDA. So SSI stands for Supplemental Security Income. And as we've been discussing, that's a cash benefit that your son or daughter can get from Social Security. DDA stands for Disability, I'm sorry, Developmental Disabilities Administration, DDA for short. That is a state government agency that's responsible for providing an array of services to people with disabilities, mostly adults with disabilities, including supported employment or day services for adults after leaving special education. Um, so 
you would be applying for SSI and applying for DDA completely separately. Okay. They're completely separate systems. And if you've already applied for DDA, that's great. You can also apply for SSI. And applying for SSI could actually help your son or daughter qualify for services from DDA. Okay. Almost all the time, in order for your son or daughter to get services from DDA, they must be getting medical assistance, also known as Medicaid. Yes. If they get approved for SSI, then they'll get Medicaid, medical assistance. And that will be one of the requirements for them to get services from DDA. So it's two birds with one stone. Okay. Thanks, Bonnie. Okay, we Thank have you. a question from Carol, and then I have a question from um, the chat to ask. Um, good evening. Okay, I guess um, Bonnie's question was half of my question. Um, my, my granddaughter's already been approved for the DDA, but she doesn't get the SSI, and she's on a waiting list. Um, so you're saying I should still go ahead and uh, uh, apply for the SSI benefits? That's right. There are three reasons to apply for SSI, at least three. Number one, if your granddaughter is approved, she'll get money in the form of SSI payments uh, to help cover her living expenses. Number two, if she gets approved for the SSI money, she'll also get the medical assistance, also known as Medicaid, which can which will give her health care and the like. And number three, the medical assistance will also help her be eligible for the services from DDA. Now, I, I realize she's on a waiting list right now. But if she ended up getting approved for services from DDA, she would still need the medical assistance for them to actually provide the services. So if you apply for SSI, you're going to be helping her in three ways. She gets money, pay for living expenses. She gets medical benefit to cover her health care needs. And she gets the same medical benefit that helps her qualify for services from DDA. Okay, yeah, because she's um, they just she's been approved for that part, so we're just waiting for that to kick in. So right. I just need to go back and apply for the SSI benefits, and she already get the Medicaid, the medical part to the Medicaid and stuff like that. So the only part of that she's not getting is the SSI benefits. Okay, I should mention that. There are actually dozens of different ways to get Medicaid or medical assistance okay. Okay. in the state of Maryland. And uh, actually there are over 50 different ways to get Medicaid in Maryland. There are more ways to get Medicaid than there are ways to leave your lover in our great state. Um, and your granddaughter is probably getting medical assistance another way okay. other than getting SSI. That other way that she's getting it might have an age limit. She might not be eligible for it. For example, once she turns 19, um, I, I, I'm, I'm just saying, for example, I'm not sure how she's getting medical assistance. But if she gets SSI, she'll get medical assistance that could potentially last for the rest of her life. Okay. So it's okay. definitely a good thing to do, even if she has medical assistance now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Great in-depth questions, um, folks. Um, so in the chat, there's a question um, about before the age of 18, if you want to try to get SSI for your child, what is the income limit for a single parent? Yeah, that is a great question. And um, it depends on the type of income the parent has, whether it's all earnings like wages from work, whether it's uh, so-called unearned income like a pension or a social security benefit 
or a combination of the two. It also depends on whether you have any other children, any other minor children living with you in your home. Um, so I can't give you an across the board answer, unfortunately. However, if Anne doesn't mind, if you were to um, email Anne the, the following information, and I'll go through it slowly, and she can email me and I can reply with an estimated income limit for you, the parent. Okay, so what we need to know is, does your son or daughter, your, your child who's applying for SSI, or you like to apply for SSI for, have any income of their own? If so, what kind and how much? Number two, do you, the parent, have income and what kind and how much? Well, actually, no, you don't have to say how much, just what kind. Like if you're, all of your income, you, the parent, is from your job, then you can just say only income from work. But if you've got other kinds of income, a pension, a social security payment, anything like that, you want to specify that. Um, and do you have other children under age 18 living with you? And how many? And do those children have any income of their own? I apologize for all the questions, but, um, but that's what I'd need to know in order to be able to tell you what your specific income limit would be. But it's a great question and I'm really happy to answer it if you can provide that information. And Pam, I just put my um, email address in the chat box. It's akennedy3 at bcps.org. So please feel free to go ahead and follow up on that. Um, and okay. the chat, yeah, okay. In the chat, there is a question, um, something you covered already, but maybe you could just quickly um, you know, go over the difference between SSI and SSDI. Yes, great question. Uh, so SSI is Supplemental Security Income. It's a benefit based on having a disability or being at least 65 years old and not having much money, having income and resources below certain fairly low limits. It's designed to just make sure you've got at least a basic minimum amount of money to pay for food and shelter. SSDI stands for Social Security Disability Insurance. That's a benefit that a person gets if they have a severe disability. This, the definition of disability for SSDI is the same as for SSI. But SSDI is an insurance program. It's not an income maintenance program. It's not based on financial need like SSI. It's based on the individual or in some cases a parent having worked and paid social security taxes on their earnings. When you pay social security taxes on your earnings, that's the FICA payroll tax that you can find on your pay stub. That's like paying your insurance premiums. And if you've paid into the system long enough, then you can qualify for SSDI. So a person with a dis an adult with a disability could get SSDI if they've worked long enough themselves, or they could get SSDI as an adult if they have a parent and the parent is getting social security retirement or the parent is getting Social Security Disability Insurance, SSDI themselves, or the parent is deceased. And I'm sorry, I can't go into more detail about that. It's a, uh, there, there's a more, lot more to say about that, but we're pretty much yeah. out of time. We are out of time. Um, and Karen, it's, it's a matter of months. Um, quite a few months is a timeline. It's not really, we can't really know for sure, but there are things you can do that are part of the PowerPoint that you'll have access to. Um, so what do you do if you do, um, do you have one, one more 
question, Michael, sure. in the chat. If you have accidentally saved a lot of money in your kid's name, um, how do you deal with that before you start applying for SSI? Okay. Well, um, depends on how much you mean by a lot. Um, over, over, over the asset limits. Right. Well, um, if your, your son or daughter has a severe disability and their disability began before age 26, and I'm assuming that's, that refers to everybody uh, on this webinar, um, then your son or daughter can open an ABLE account. Go to ABLE, or I'm sorry, Maryland spelled out, ABLE, A-B-L-E dot org to get information about those accounts. I'd mentioned them earlier. Yep. Um, I'll, I'll stop you here because on May 20th, we're having um, an ABLE account representative come and do a transition chat. So you'll have opportunity to hear lots more about that or you could go to their website now. Terrific. And yeah. uh, and anybody can contribute to an ABLE account, the person with a disability who owns it, um, parents, other family, friends, neighbors, strangers, um, but generally the maximum contributions to an ABLE account in a calendar year uh, is $18,000 total. And a total of up to $100,000 in an ABLE account does not count against that $2,000 resource limit for SSI. Suppose there's more money. Suppose a relative leaves um, your son or daughter $500,000 in their will. Um, that's going to be too much for an ABLE account to take care of. That's when you want to look at a special needs trust. I don't know if you've got a future session on that. Um, we do have uh, somebody actually in April coming to talk about guardianship and trusts and um, all those things. So that's April 29th. So all of these things are going to back piggyback on, on each other. And um, hopefully everyone here has an interest can attend those. Um, I'm going to let Michael go because he's given us a lot of information. This presentation will be uploaded to the Department of Special Ed resource page um, within the next few days. Um, I, anybody who left me with their um, email address, I'll send you the PowerPoint slides um, tonight or tomorrow morning. Um, and um, this was really great information, Michael. I can't thank you enough. Thank you, everyone. Best of luck. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Anne, for putting this together. I appreciate it.